Welcome to the Cabin Culture Podcast, where we spend a little more time diving deeper into all the fun parts of cabin culture. We like to think of this as both the material and imagined expressions of how cabin lovers, dwellers, builders, designers, and dreamers wish to live a more simple and authentic life. Today's episode, we take a quick break from cabin owners and hosts to focus on some of the important topics that keep popping up, like direct booking. This episode comes at a perfect time for us at Chalet as we close in on one full year since we opened our doors and prior guests have started to reach out about booking another stay in the upcoming seasons. Janice asks all the important questions and Jared gives us some great insight on why setting up direct booking could be beneficial to your short-term rental. And how does Jared know all this about direct booking? Well, his business is building websites for hosts specifically to accept direct booking Not only that, but he supports the sites that he builds for you so you can focus on hosting. If you're someone who already direct books, feel free to let us know in the DMs or the comments on Janice's Reel for the episode what we missed or in what ways it benefits your short-term rental. Enjoy the show. Okay, Jared, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. you. Oh, thank you. I'm super excited to to come on. I've, uh, I've been listening to you guys for a while, so ready. Yeah, welcome. Okay, so you also have a podcast. So let's start with you introducing yourself and what you do and what your podcast is about. Sure. So I'm Jared Johnson. Um, as you guys can probably tell, I'm originally from London. I hope I'm not losing the accent too much. Um, and I run a company called Direct Vacation Bookings. And what we do is create uh, direct booking websites for vacation property owners such as yourself. And we we create them, but we also maintain them as well. Uh, I think a lot of people don't necessarily want to have the extra stuff that comes with direct bookings. So yeah, we'll maintain the website, make sure it's up to date. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the main thing. And then we've got the podcast, which is we speak to people within the vacation property space. So that'll be owners, influencers, content um, makers. And we basically try to find out a little bit more about the people behind it. Um, Throughout my work, I've seen a lot of people really have super interesting stories. And you never really, a lot of the time, you never get to meet the hosts and stuff like that. But you'd be surprised how many people have, like even if you listen to your podcast, how many cool stories people have. So Mm -hmm. um, no, it's it's been great. I'm new to it, but it's been good fun. I love it. So folks listening can probably guess exactly why I've brought you on the podcast today. And I'm excited to say that this is the launch. We don't have a name for it yet, but most of our episodes have just been getting to know hosts in the cabin space, um, as well as some photographers and folks like that. But I'm looking to start a new series of episodes that are really topical, really focused on topics that come up a lot in all these conversations with folks. But at the end of the day, none of us are experts. We all have different opinions, different perspectives. And Mm -hmm. this felt like a good place to start because it's come up on multiple past episodes and my particular aversion to direct booking. So we're really going to be talking specifically just about direct bookings And, you know, obviously you're a little bit biased because you run a company called Direct (laughs) direct Vacation Bookings, but I am also a little bit biased. So I think this will be a really good conversation that hopefully for folks listening can help them think about pros and cons and what makes the most sense for their business and where they're at. So, but before we dive into that, can you give me a little context about what brought you to the vacation rental space? Have you ever owned a short-term rental? Um, What made what like created the start of your business? Sure. So I've always loved traveling. Um, don't ask me why, but I've always, since I was 14, I've always dreamt of traveling. So I've always obviously stayed at properties and stuff like that. But I have uh, family members who own vacation properties in Florida. And a few years ago, they obviously, they have been doing Airbnb and they've been doing really well on that. But they wanted to try and get, they had a lot of returning customers and they wanted to try and get people coming through without their normal process would be, okay, someone emails them, says, oh, can we stay again? They have to block out the dates in Airbnb. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to find a way of collecting the money. So it was really Uh long-winded. And I was like, my background, I've been a developer for over 10 years or over a decade. So my background was in development. So I was like, okay, I'll create this for my family member. And uh, because I was always traveling, I was like, why don't I ever like approach people to book directly? Because I think Airbnb is great. I'm not going to bash Airbnb too much on this. 
Um, but I think the issue is sometimes is that the fees can be crazy. Because I looked, mm-hmm. for example, at your property. If I wanted to stay two nights, <laughs> it would be an extra, let's say, $150 plus to stay. Yeah. And, you know, we're buddies now. We're friends. So why can't I just message you and just be like, hey, like, or go onto your website and book it directly and save that money. And you could potentially make a portion of that. You could charge an extra 15%. And still be cheaper than Airbnb. So yeah. um, that's how the idea originally came about. So it's through a family member and then it kind of built off off that. A true entrepreneur. You heard about a challenge that someone was facing and you're like, I can develop a solution to this. Let me go. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Me being a developer actually helps with that a lot. Maybe if I wasn't, it would have been a bit different. But um, no. I feel like that's such an amazing, I mean, I used to run a startup and the bane of my existence for the years that I ran it was that I wasn't a developer. So finding a technical co-founder and working with someone to take the ideas and visions and what I was learning from customers and then implement it quickly and iterate all the time to keep improving was just nearly impossible not being a developer. So definitely a huge value add. Okay, let's get into the nitty gritty uh, because I've I've voiced my opinion. So I want to I want to kind of break this down in the advantages of direct booking for go for get. I'm mixing both of them together. The advantages of direct booking for hosts and the advantages of direct booking for guests. And then on the flip side, I want to look at the challenges of direct booking for hosts and the challenges of direct booking for guests. So I'm clearly on one side of this. So I've actually developed quite a list on the challenges. Okay, oh, my damn, list, you came prepared. <laughs> but my list on the advantage side is a bit shorter. So I'd love okay. for you to start us off by saying, okay, I'm a host. When you're talking to hosts, what are the advantages of direct booking? You just mentioned one, which is that I could charge a little bit more and keep that in my own pocket versus yep. giving some of it to Airbnb. Yep. I think another one which we tried to push heavily is that Airbnb is great. But you've also got to remember that Airbnb, they decide everything, right? So say, for example, you have an issue, and this has come up with people I've worked with, where they've had an issue with a guest who's made a complaint, Airbnb suspended their account. If you have no other way of being able to get people in, essentially your business is is on hold until you resolve that with Airbnb, and you're completely beholden to them 100%. And I think this is what I would say about direct bookings is that I wouldn't say do a hundred percent, all your bookings should be direct bookings because then you've also got it on the other side, right? If something happens to your website or whatever, but I think for example, I always think of it as like, if you buy like, I don't know, let's say a Fanta, they don't just sell it at Walmart or for people from the UK in Sainsbury's, they sell it at multiple places because if they have an issue with Walmart or Sainsbury's or wherever, they're still able to sell it. And I think that's the only, that's one of the reasons it's quite dangerous for some people. I I do want to preface that. I would like to say that like direct bookings are not for everyone. Like if you're running a condo in, let's say Miami or something like that, probably easy to just go with Airbnb. Um, If you have a beautiful cabin or an A-frame, it might be something to look into because it just, it's, uh, I think the good thing about, for example, your Instagram, because I was looking through your post, is that it's very popular. You have nearly 100,000 followers. And when, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but when, because we originally connected over repeat guests. And in my mind, when we spoke, I was like, well, if you're already getting the repeat guests, you don't actually need Airbnb anymore. Like, they do the marketing for you to bring people in. And then you've done the work. And then you're passing it back to them and they're taking a the cut. I'm like, what is going on? So, um, yes. That is that a good was, point. Yes. I will give you that. Specifically for you, I did want to, uh, I guess, get a better understanding of what the thinking was because, you know, I think you're right. There is definitely uh, advantages to Airbnb, which I'm sure you'll you'll go into. But, yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting, though, because the one that I had for advantages of direct booking for hosts was, and I'm sure you've heard that from lots of folks, but not being beholden to Airbnb or VRBO or whatever platform you're using. But during COVID, that was a big problem. We have a strict cancellation. And then during COVID, they made the ultimate decision that any guest could cancel any stay 
no matter what your cancellation policy was. So as a business owner who has made the decision that makes the most sense for my business, knowing that a lot of people won't book because we have a strict policy and being okay with that. And yep. then, so I took that risk and probably lost bookings for years because we were a strict cancellation. And then the moment where making that business decision would benefit me as a host, Airbnb stepped in and took that away. And yep. so that felt very personal to me, despite I do have a, a loyalty to Airbnb to a certain degree, but that was the first point where I was like, I don't love that they have control over my business now. And that at any point, they can make decisions that will impact my revenue. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, it's like with anything, it's like with Instagram or Facebook, like you're beholden to their rules. And obviously, you know, we enjoy using these platforms. So we accept that as one of the disadvantages, but it's obviously something to be aware of. It's the same with Instagram. If one day they decide to kick you off, a lot of the time they won't even tell you the reason and say, see ya. And yeah. you'll have to start all over from scratch. So yeah. And that's really well. scary when you've spent years and years and years building it up. If they were to suspend my Airbnb profile, all of those five-star reviews that I worked my ass off for will be gone and you have to start all over. And I think anyone, we all, at least in this community, there tends to be a lot of really attentive hosts who care deeply yep. about reviews and four-star reviews kill them. And you're putting in all this work, but at any moment it could be gone. Same with Instagram. If you've built up followers by consistently putting in the work to put out content that's helpful and then someone could make a decision or hack your account or something like that is really scary. Yeah. Okay. What about advantages of direct booking for guests? One of these is obvious, but please state it for us anyway. Yeah. For me personally, this is a someone, if I can book direct, I a hundred percent will. It's just mm -hmm. cheaper. It's just yeah. a fact because, you know, part of the reason you're, I think paying extra is because Airbnb obviously needs to take that cut. So if you're a guest, um, yeah, I, I tend to try and book direct now, you know, obviously I'm a bit biased, but if possible, I will. And if I can see that it looks like, you know, a reputable property with good reviews, um, I'm more than happy to do it. So yeah, as a guest, if you want to save money, book direct. Yep. Okay. So here's my question on that front. And this leads to kind of the challenges of direct booking for guests. Aside from finding someone on Instagram or having booked through Airbnb and then in their guest book, they say, if you want to come back, here's our direct booking website. If yep. I were say most of my travel is like this, we're going to, let's see, I'm going to Leeds, Massachusetts for a shoot next in a couple of weeks. And I went to look up a place to stay. It's easy if I go to Airbnb, it shows me a map and all the properties. How do I find direct booking ones unless it's like a well-publicized property? For sure. So normally what I do, and this doesn't work for everyone, but what I will do is I will look it up on Airbnb and I might find a property I like. And sometimes what you will have is they'll have the name of the actual like company or Instagram of whoever's booking it. Um, funny enough, uh, earlier this year, I actually found like a really small cottage in uh, in Mexico in like some really small town where I just messaged the guy on Instagram and I found him on Airbnb and I was like hey do you do it direct and in Mexico he was just like yeah sure we'll do it and I, it mm. was uh I saved a decent amount of money so there are ways of doing it what I would say is that Airbnb and this is fair for them to do is they try and keep the information as as tight as possible oh yeah so it's one of those things obviously they don't want people going off platform so that can be an issue 100%. Um, I think that goes into, and I guess we'll talk about this later on, but it's about how do you, because you're right, with Airbnb, your property is publicized to the world and it's kind of sorted. But um, I guess for you, because you have so many five-star reviews, which congratulations for that, by the way. I had a look before the podcast and I was like, I'm not sure I've seen this many reviews, all five stars. So you're doing <laughs> a good you. job for sure. <laughs> Thank you. But um. No, it's one of those things where it can be difficult to find them sometimes, but there's definitely ways to do it. And I think it's just being aware of how to get people in. But I think the good thing for you, for example, is you have nearly 100,000 followers. So maybe not all of them are people who will ever stay in your property. Maybe they just like the look of it. But let's say even it's half a, half a percent. That's a lot of people who could potentially be interested. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you kind of have marketing built in. So it's definitely, I guess it's like with your Instagram, I'm assuming, how long did it take for you to get to a point where you have this many followers? I'm assuming it's years, no? Two years. Yeah. Maybe oh, three wow. years. Maybe three years. Man. 
you, you're good at this then. Okay. Because <laughs> I think I just a lot spend of people... too much time on social media. Let's be honest. <laughs> hey, it's working. It's working well because I think that's the thing. A lot of people, the issue they have with direct bookings is that it's it is a bit like Instagram where it is work because essentially what you're doing, you're setting your stall up and you're telling people to come. But say, for example, I create a new restaurant in, let's say, New York or something like that. People aren't just going to turn up like just right. because. Right. So, you know, it's going to take time, um, you know, and that's why it's great for people who already have an Instagram following because they can already start promoting that. If you started doing direct bookings tomorrow, you could just throw something up on your right. on your Instagram, just being like, hey, save 15 percent booking direct and right. probably start getting people. So, right. Yeah. Even if it was just for a repeat guess, I can I can be a little bit more convinced on that front because I do love them and I do see the value in that. And so if they could book direct and maybe I charge the same price. So I lose a little bit of money. Uh, oh no, I wouldn't lose anything. I would just save it for them if I book yeah. direct, right? Yeah. Then that would be worth well, it for me as a way to give them a discount without actually losing any revenue on my part. Or you could even do, for specific, let's say specifically for you, you could charge, let's say an extra 10% um, because that fee is not being taken out because Airbnb is normally 15 to 20. You could give them a discount of let's say five to even 7%. And you'd still be cheaper than Airbnb and you'd be making 10% more. So. Yeah. 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 So that goes back to what you originally said, which is convincing of like, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And even um, with newer cabins or A-frames, listing it on Airbnb, but then having a direct booking option for folks who find them that way. And you don't need 100,000 Instagram followers to book even completely via direct booking. I think if you have the right followers and you're capitalizing yep. on past guests and getting them to follow you and things like that, then if you have a thousand followers, if you have 500 followers and almost all of them are people who've stayed there before, you have an active, engaged audience who would be more yeah. apt to use direct booking. No, yeah. 100%. And one of the people I've been working with recently is an A-frame out in, in Canada and they do elopements as well. So what they can do is they can also promote that through there because the thing is you can't really promote that through. I know Airbnb have experiences, but you also have control of how you promote your business, right? Airbnb, every all the listings look exactly the same. But how you might like your listing to look like and how someone across the world is going to be, you know, one of those things where it might be slightly different. So you have complete autonomy in terms of how you do that. So, um, yeah, I think for them, I'm assuming you probably have like a decent like email list. Imagine they started building that up. You could start promoting your other businesses as well and being like, hey, yeah. we loved having you at our property. Here's 5% off to get some videos of your of your dogs. <laughs> we don't video dogs, but that's really funny. It sure does sound like we do. I saw a dog in the background. I was like, what kind of dog <laughs> well, is that? The company name is Big Dog Little Bed, so it would make sense if we did. But that's really funny. Okay, but that you did just bring up another advantage for hosts, though, that I didn't have on my list, which is visual brand alignment. When you're on Airbnb, yep. it is branded with Airbnb all over it. And that's, I mean, that's fine for a lot of purposes. But if you're developing, I'm thinking about like Fort Treehouse up in Canada, they're developing yep. um, multiple properties and a hotel-like property. And for them, I can see where it would make sense to almost have your own branded website where you have control over the SEO. If you're hosting events, yep. you can advertise engagements. So someone searching for an elopement location might not go onto Airbnb. They might search elopement location, Canada. I forget exactly what town they're in. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and then they, they would show up there with a site that their brand is just very visually distinct in my mind. Um, yep. And the site could be aligned with that. A hundred percent. I think a lot of what direct booking is about is starting to try and take back more control. And like I said before, I would, there's not anyone I would recommend being like, don't use Airbnb at all. Mm -hmm. um, just because like I said, like if there is an issue with your direct bookings, you've still got that coming in. Mm -hmm. It's just about, I guess, diversifying the ways that you're bringing people in. And like I said before, like I don't think you can ever have too many ways of promoting your property. Obviously, you don't want to have it so many that it's overwhelming. But, you know, if you have two or three, if one of those, an issue comes up with one of them, you at least have the ability to be able to use another one. And you're not worried about completely losing revenue for however long it takes to fix that particular right. issue. 
That's right. Because when, and this is what I felt during COVID when those things happen, it's not like uh, my mortgage company is suddenly like, oh, you couldn't get any booking. So uh, it's fine. We'll, we'll hold off on your mortgage payment for this month. Or like, oh, the electric company will give me a, a month delay until I sort things out with Airbnb. <laughs> No, hundred percent. And uh, I think ultimately, you know, it is a business that you're running, but you also need to, you have a mortgage you need to pay. And That's if right. no money's coming in for two months, that could be a big difference between, you know, uh, that could be a lot of money. So yeah. Right. And that's really scary for folks. And I didn't feel this way for a long time. I mean, it was a bummer, like when COVID happened, but I still had a full time job, although COVID was hard for all of the things, but yeah. um, I still work full time. So this is supplementary income for us and savings for retirement. So it's definitely a bummer, but it's not like life changing. But a lot of folks, when they do really well with short term rentals, will scale and build more and people will leave their jobs. And that's a whole different situation when your yep. entire livelihood and supporting your family is dependent on that revenue. That's game changing when something like that happens. No, hundred percent. And you know, it is important for a lot of, a lot of people because you're saying, you know, you have your main job, but like you said, this could potentially be money to go towards your retirement and stuff like right. that. And you are growing it as well, right? You said that you have multiple properties. So mm -hmm. Have you been looking to take direct bookings but don't know how or where to get started? Well, look no further than Direct Vacation Bookings, your ultimate solution to hassle-free direct bookings. We create beautiful direct booking websites that have all the features you need to make taking bookings quick and easy. Want to allow guests to check availability and book directly through you? We got that. Want to be able to have automated calendar syncing so you don't have to worry about double bookings? We got that as well. Want to be able to sell additional services at checkout so you can make more money and upsell your guests? Of course. And the best thing about it is not only will we create the website for you, but we'll help you maintain it too. So you can do what you do best, hosting. And for all listeners of the Cabin Culture Podcast, we're offering 10% off your site creation. To get a demo, contact us at directvacationbookings.com. Or alternatively, you can drop us a DM on Instagram at Direct Vacation Bookings and set up a demo today. Yeah. Yeah. Deal. Okay. So advantages of direct booking for guests. I have saved money. Is there anything else? Uh, what have we gone through? So we've talked about more control. Um, we've talked about potentially promoting other businesses that you might have okay, as well. This is all for hosts though, from a guest perspective. Ah, for, oh, ah, for, guests. for travelers. Yeah. I have saved money, um, but that's the only one, which is a big one and maybe the only thing that I was going to say, uh, most of the time when I'm looking for property, that's normally the one which I'm thinking about the most. Um, yeah, I guess it's also a good way, depending on how they obviously promote their property, it's a good way of keeping up to date with what they're doing. And mm. say, for example, you do open a new cabin and I'm like, wow, I like the look of that cabin. I need to go there. It's one of those things where I can come in and be like hey like i'd love to stay at this place so yeah i think it definitely i would say that's another advantage as well for sure okay now let's move to the challenges of direct booking for hosts do you want to start sure. with those or do you want me to start and then you can address them um yeah go on why don't, <laughs> why don't you start and we'll, okay. we'll go from there okay. i do have a few for sure i am biased but i have a few Okay. Well, you've talked to a lot of users, so I'm sure you've heard when talking to people like what their hesitancies are. So I'm Understood. confident you have a decent understanding of this. The first one was marketing, which we've kind of talked about, especially yep. if you're newer or you don't have the time to put into marketing. So you've seen yep. just the Cozy Rock Instagram, which has almost 100,000 followers, but I do have Instagrams for other two properties and they're not 100,000 followers because I don't spend time on them because the reality of marketing is that it is really time consuming. And sure. um, when you have multiple properties, doing that consistently for a handful of properties is really challenging. So I rely almost exclusively on Airbnb for those properties um, okay. and repeat guests where I think direct booking could come in. But marketing does feel like um, one of the biggest ones that I hear in terms of uh, a disadvantage of direct booking. Yeah. So I think in terms of that, why I would stress is because I think we do live in a world now where everyone wants everything yesterday is that it is something that is going to take time and effort. Um, I'm assuming it's the same with, with Airbnb as well, right? You don't just, I know there are some people who throw it on Airbnb and they get great, like great people coming through and they immediately have interest. But I was also thinking like, obviously there's a lot of people on Airbnb, 
when was the last time you went to the page five or page 10 on Airbnb? Like for every, I guess, cozy cabin, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are never found and probably have beautiful properties, but for whatever reason, maybe their pictures aren't super nice or maybe yep. the the listing. So um, I think obviously Airbnb is probably a little bit, it's, it's less work for sure. But I think it is one of those things which it does take time, it does take effort, but I do believe that the upsides of it are far outweigh the the downsides. So 100%, that's definitely something which people push back on. Um, we tend to work with people that do have kind of some type of marketing that they've got set up. So whether that's Instagram or Facebook or something like that, just because for them, it's a little bit easier to get started because they already have a base. Cause like you said, you can have 500 people. And even if let's say 10% of the people end up booking at some point, you can make a decent amount of money from that. So a hundred percent marketing is definitely something people push back on. Um, I think it's slowly starting to become easier and easier because there's different ways of doing it, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, uh, email marketing or e like stuff like that. So it's definitely something to think about for sure. And I think that is probably one of the larger things that we do get pushed back on is it's like, OK, how do we do marketing? Um, it's a bit like SEO. SEO is a bit like that because I work with people who do seo and it can be a bit frustrating because essentially what you're telling people is believe in what i'm saying that in 12 months you'll be getting people in but like for the first few months you might not get anything so and once you do you, know. you still can't prove that it necessarily came from the changes they made yes people in seo they deserve <laughs> a lot of credit because it is one of those things where you are kind of selling a dream so yes you know i am very skeptical yeah. of seo for my for my business not skeptical i believe in its importance but just like i find it so hard to vet people and figure out like what's right it's okay difficult. it is yeah okay so the next one is a big one for me which is no reviews or ways of vetting guests so people who go through direct booking it's my understanding i haven't done a lot of this as we've talked about but it's my understanding that like i can't necessarily reject them i can't see what past hosts have to say about them there's like no way for me to really vet that they will be a good guest for sure so i think there are tools that you can use 100 percent where you send them information about who the the person is so name their dress stuff like that and they're able to do background checks um so you're definitely 100 percent able to do that in terms of picking who stays um you can always set it so that people can inquire or people can say listen i want a book similar to how i guess airbnb have it where you can either have it where it's auto books them mm -hmm. um so you can do it in a similar way uh reviews yeah I guess that's one thing that would potentially be an issue. Um, so yeah, it would just, I guess, be doing your your due diligence. I think a lot of people use direct bookings for repeat customers um, yeah. just because it's a good way of being able to, you already know what they're like. If they're not great, that's then right. you're like, see ya. And if they are, then you're yeah. more than happy to pass on that discount to them and potentially make more money. So um, yeah, it's obviously something which there are ways to do it where you have more security and more control of who's booking a hundred percent. Yeah. And that's where, again, in the all or nothing, as I consider something like this, I don't think I'm in a world where I would ever go all to direct booking, but I could be convinced to go for repeat guests via direct yep. booking, because if they've been there once and taken good care of it, there's no reason for me to believe they'd come back and trash it the next time. And small stuff that might go wrong or whatever isn't a big deal. You break a wine glass, fine. You leave some dishes in the sink. It's not the end of the world. Obviously, I'd prefer yeah. if you didn't. But to me, that's not like a big consequence for me as a host or a homeowner. No, no, for sure. I did have a quick question about the repeat guest stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you just let them book direct even if you were just doing it where you just went to them and said okay cool we'll book up the or we'll block the dates in airbnb just send me the money through venmo because surely that would be so easy for you no yeah it would be there's a couple of reasons i haven't done it so one of them is paying taxes 
um, and having to figure out the state and local taxes and having to do all that manually is just one thing on my plate that I don't have to do right now. And Airbnb does all of it. And to be totally honest, when it comes to running my businesses, that is hands down my least favorite part. Anything that requires me to like mail stuff in or government stuff, you. like there's a chance it's not going to get done. And then all of a sudden I'm in violation of laws and will my business get shut down? Like that's a big one yeah. for me. Another yeah. one, and this is a weird one, but I do all my own financial bookkeeping and tracking my income for every month and like over years that I've had these properties and studying the trends of when do we make more, when do we not. And Airbnb distributes the money like on the second day of their stay. And if I collect it myself, then it's like, do I collect a deposit? Do I figure out what that is? I don't want to wait to collect it till the week of the stay because then they could cancel and we don't have the money. But then all of my numbers don't accurately reflect what the actual guest count is that month. Whereas the way Airbnb does it, when I look at my gross revenue for each individual cabin each month, that is true to how many guests we had in and out of our cabins that month. And so I know that's silly, but like right now I do, I have done a couple like that. Um, one of my former students, I used to teach middle school and high school, and I taught her in both. And she's coming to stay in November. I'm so excited. And so I've done that off-platform for her. and okay. But she's paying each month towards that. So it's throwing off all my numbers, which is like not a big deal. But the month that That's she comes, nice. it's going to look like we have less revenue because she's been paying it over time. And all of these months, it looks like we're booking more guests when we're not. It's just her paying her deposit. So honestly, you. those are the two biggest reasons. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I know we, I know we jumped around a little bit. I was just wondering, cause uh, yeah, I do remember the conversation we had and when you put up the list of uh, ways to get repeat guests, I was like, this is a no brainer. Cause we've, we've actually spoken about direct bookings before a few times. Yeah. Um, and I know you've, you've spoken about it a lot on your show. So I'm always, I'm always interested to, to know why it's always good, good knowledge. Yeah. And those are like silly small things, but that's where it's like when you're running a business and three rental properties, any yeah. small thing that makes my life easier is easy. Um, that I'm just like, this is working. I'm not going to mess with it. <laughs> 100%. Okay. So related to reviews, building off of that, if something did go wrong. So if I were direct booking and someone came and I didn't have reviews and then they damaged a whole bunch of stuff, like what is my accountability with that guest outside of local law enforcement? Okay. So this is an interesting one because I, I talk a lot to people about air cover and the insurance that Airbnb provide. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like there's a slight misconception of kind of what Airbnb offer. Have you ever had to use air cover by any chance? Nope. Okay. But I haven't heard great things. So tell us what you know, because I honestly don't know a ton about it. And I'm guessing a lot of our listeners don't either. Yep. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll explain what kind of what I know. And then I'll also bring up a story because I was literally, I had a podcast episode with someone recently about this. So it's basically for, say, for example, you have like a tree house and someone falls out of the tree house. It kind of covers that. And it also covers certain damages. But for example, it doesn't cover like amenities. Like there's a whole bunch of, if you actually look through the list of stuff it covers, it's limited. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because obviously it's like with any insurance company, they don't really want to pay out unless they really have to. Right. So this would be for nearly anyone who has a vacation property. I would recommend getting some type of other insurance. And they even say it on, if you look at the air cover page, they even say like supplement this with other insurance. Yeah. Because the last thing you want is say, for example, uh, you live somewhere where there's hurricanes or tornado. If something falls on your house, you can't call Airbnb. They're not right. coming. Right. So I would suggest to anyone uh, that they should have some form of insurance to protect their property, protect the things there and all that stuff. Totally and agree. That... And most folks who have mortgages have to have homeowners insurance, which will cover some things. We added yep. two million of liability on top of that, plus an umbrella policy. So okay. we've got ourselves covered outside of Airbnb. So anything that Airbnb would or could provide us is considered a bonus in my mind. But I'm thinking more about smaller things. If someone tears open my leather couch, right? Like that's yeah. kind of a, it's a problem. It's not the end of the world. They didn't burn my cabin down. Um, but like, I couldn't even write them a bad review if it was direct booking, let alone force them to like pay me money. Can you collect a security deposit? Is that how you would do it? 
A hundred percent. You can definitely collect a security deposit and um, yeah, I would probably recommend that's best way to do it to protect yourself from that situation. Um, yeah, I guess a quick question, I guess you would know better than me. So in terms of with Airbnb, do you feel like when say, so some, say someone does come in and does ruin something, if you give them a bad review, do you feel like Airbnb make an effort to kind of reach out and be like, try to resolve the issue? Like, have you ever had to report anyone and be like, hey, this has happened? And did you feel like they kind of came in and dealt with it? Yeah, I've been lucky. I've heard some horror stories, but I've had to make claims for small things. And with Airbnb, okay. what's weird is that they don't collect the security deposit up front. You yeah. have to then provide requests photos and receipts and all that. And then they have to mediate and decide if they can force that person to pay. And I yep. think the person has to agree to pay. And then if they don't, it goes to the next like level of arbitration or whatever. And yep. I've had to make several claims and it was all well-documented and Airbnb okay. had my back and we got all of them. But I, I will be fair in saying that I've heard some stories where that has not been the case of other folks with bigger damages, like a kitchen fire they really struggled to get Airbnb to cover the damages and any of the stuff they promised. And to this day, I still don't know if they ever received that from Airbnb. Yeah, I was talking to someone recently and uh, some guests sunk a, they threw a party and sunk a boat. And oh my God. He yeah. So he tried to go to Airbnb and be like, hey, we like these guys sunk my boat. There was only supposed to be max 10 guests at the place uh because i think that's the max at the time that you could put on airbnb and essentially they tried to take airbnb to court but those airbnb lawyers you know they, right uh, they have a lot of money good. yep that's right so in the end he didn't end up winning um because he thought it would be a no-brainer because you know airbnb don't really do um they really they really are kind of they have strong policies on parties now because so i think during the pandemic people were renting houses and basically yeah. trashing them so um yeah that's obviously something to be aware of and that's not everyone it's great that you obviously have right. good stories and i think that's a lot of people do i'm not i'm definitely not saying anything bad about air cover but it's just being obviously aware that if something does happen you might have to pay out of pocket potentially because they might be like, hey, this is not covered for whatever right. reason. Right. Yeah. I will say in terms of them having my back, this has only happened to me once and I was really skeptical at first when it did. But someone requested to book and then Airbnb stepped in and said, please be wary of this reservation and like maybe prevented them from booking or did something. And at first I was like, why are you preventing bookings? And it was over Halloween. And I remember calling customer support and they said, we're very careful about reservations always, but especially over certain holidays, Halloween being one of them. And this guest yeah, has yeah. red flags in their record that we cannot share with you. But we believe that these yep. red flags indicate that this will not be a safe reservation for you. And as soon as they told me that, I was like, cool, thank you for protecting me. Yeah. And I didn't have to like do that myself. And that felt sure. like they had my back. Because yeah. they were losing yeah. money no, off that too, right? Yeah. No, that's definitely great. And you're right. Halloween, I know how how the US do Halloween and uh it's a big deal. In the UK, we do it like a lower level, like it's not even as close cuz I actually spent a decent amount of time in the US and yeah, Halloween's a big deal over there. So, I mean, yeah, it's probably best uh, they didn't come to your property for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the next one which I kind of mentioned when I answered your question, but I'm curious what your response is to it, which is paying taxes. Do you all offer something through the direct booking site that you've created that handles the tax situation? Or if you do direct booking, is that up to hosts to do all of that? So for our particular case, it's up to hosts. So I guess one of the advantages, which I didn't speak about before, is that you get the money up front. You can do a deposit and say, uh, we want, let's say, 20%. Yeah, say they book, let's say, a year before you say we want 20% now and 30 days before you arrive, you get the money. So up front, but in terms of, we do have reports that we, we will, cause uh, you're able to put the amount of tax that you normally pay in. But what, what normally happens is that you will then have to go in. You can use the reports obviously to, to help and assist with taxes. Um, okay. I guess one question I did have about this, cause you're right. It does come up sometimes is, do you have like a, so I'm assuming for any work that you do on your property, I'm assuming you have like a limited company or you just 
is all directly through you. It's through me. I tried, um, I tried to create an LLC to put them into it. And I'd love to do a whole podcast on this one because we get asked about it a lot. But we have yep. mortgages on all of our properties. And uh, when I tried to do that, the our mortgages were sold from small banks to big banks. And the big banks were like, no, we approved Janice Smith for the loan. We did not approve JS Rentals LLC you. for the loan. So they wouldn't okay. switch it. I get you. Okay. Because I, I, I have spoken to a few people and I always just thought, well, wouldn't it be great if you did have an LLC and then you could actually expense a lot of the stuff that you buy for your property? You can still expense. It... My accountant, you can still write off like, um, and there's a couple ways, like whatever you're spending on like utilities and stuff. I, I might get this wrong. We need to have an accountant on the podcast too. But like, she always has me. That's why I itemize everything. So I know all my expenses and I can submit them to her. Um, yeah. And then um, on the flip side, if you ever sell an investment property, the capital gains tax that you pay at the end, every improvement you've made on the property is taken out of that. So whatever appreciation yep. the property has had, you can subtract the original investment and then all improvements. And so that's why we track that really carefully. But Okay. No, because it's obviously slightly different for every every country. So I was just wondering how it is in, uh, in the States. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if you have a strong reports feature on direct booking, I can see how that would make it easier if I only had to pay once a year, once a month feels like a lot for me. I struggle with sales yep. tax at my at my business and pay someone to do it. But if like yeah. once a year, all I had to do was pull that report, figure out the amount and then just mail one check, that would be way easier than if I had to do it each individual month or even each individual stay. I don't know how that works. Yeah. So normally what we do, we kind of, so we obviously provide the reports and we allow quite a lot of flexibility in terms of how they want to deal with their taxes in terms of they put the percentage that it is, they get paid the full amount. And then normally what they'll do is they'll go, they'll take that money, they'll send it. And a lot of the people we work with are happy to do that. But no, I think it's definitely an extra step, which some people don't don't want to do and that is 100 percent one of the good things about airbnb that if you don't want to to do that or you just don't want the hassle um you know essentially i guess they can be your accountant for that particular particular thing yeah yeah and it benefits them too because the same thing with the cash flow i actually weirdly like how they do the cash flow because it just makes my records align more with actual guests but for them yeah they're getting paid right up front. It's not that the guest is waiting until their stay to pay. Then Airbnb yeah. is banking that money and probably making interest off of it, or I don't know what they do with it. Uh, but they're yeah. operating as a bank for that purpose. And I'm sure that's an additional revenue stream for them or factored into their business model in some way. I weirdly yeah. appreciate it versus collecting it from folks on my own. And that leads to my last challenge of direct booking for hosts, which is yeah. the collecting of money. So how does that work on your platform? And how have you seen that work on other platforms? Yeah. So I guess there's, you can have flexibility in terms of how you do it. What a lot of people just tend to do is they'll just, they'll charge the full amount up front, you pay it. And then that money goes directly into your account. So we have multiple ways of being able to take that, whether it's Stripe or PayPal, or depending on what country you are, you could use Venmo or something like, mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have some customers in uh, Canada, they use, they call it RBC transfers, which is the Royal Bank of Canada. So you do have some flexibility and I guess that can be an advantage as well, right? In terms of you decide how you want to get paid and say, for example, you did want to take a, for people who book, let's say over a, a month, you'll be like, okay, at least pay us 20% up front. So then if they do cancel, you've got that month and mm -hmm. then you can decide what your cancellation policy is. Because for example, I guess you brought up the fact that during COVID, they kind of your cancellation policy was kind of removed and airbnb's kind they of undermined me is what one would say yeah yeah they <laughs> came in they i was going to say is it superseded you i was trying to be a little bit too smart i was like I'm not sure that's the right <laughs> word but um yes in terms of that you can decide how you want to do it i would say 90 percent of the people we work with just say okay we just want 100 percent up front we do have some customers that will say um yeah here we want it to be 20 percent of it's over 30 days and then once it hits day 30 you pay the rest of it and that gives them a little bit of time if someone does cancel to be able to get someone else in so it protects them yeah yeah um 
who pays the transaction fees? So if you use PayPal, I know with my business, when we send invoices, if someone pays through PayPal or bank transfer, I think PayPal is 3%, bank transfer is 1%, but credit card is 3%. A lot of people yeah. like paying for vacations on credit card because they're, it's a larger amount if it's like a $1,500 stay and then they get points for that, myself included. And yeah. so, but if it's paid via credit, credit card, then you typically pay a 3% processing fee. So is that on the host to pay that fee or how does that work? So what some people will do is they'll just factor that in. So they'll just be like, okay, we're going to charge an extra 3%. They'll just put that into, let's say the nightly rate or whatever. Um, yeah, it's really, really up to the the host. When you're using stuff like PayPal and Stripe, it works exactly the same way. I guess it does if we just use it, uh, like say I'm sending you money through PayPal. It works in exactly the same way. So, okay. um, yeah, to get around that, what people would normally do is just add an extra 3% or whatever. Okay. Okay, let's move to, am I missing any? Any other challenges for hosts that I didn't name? The things um, that you hear from when folks are like, no, I can't do direct booking because. I think the insurance, um, I hear, spoken to quite a few people who are treehouse owners and for them, the insurance is just a pain in the ass because if someone falls out of their tree house, it's just, you know, it's a lot of money. So yeah. I think insurance is sometimes what we get pushback about. Um, and that's why I really started doing investigation about, okay, how much does air cover actually cover you? Um, yeah. But no, I think that's most of the things I can think about. Normally it's insurance, uh, taxes, and those are the main ones. Uh, marketing tends to be a, uh one as well but we do tend to work with people who who do have at least a decent following on let's say instagram because that's a lot of the way we get in touch with people so yeah. i think that helps a lot in terms of kind of mitigating that that issue and that makes sense to me when i see people on instagram with decent followings who are doing direct booking that makes sense to me you're doing your own marketing you have already committed to putting in the time to do the marketing you can then funnel people directly into that it doesn't make sense to me or it confuses me when I see brand new rental owners with like a couple hundred followers on Instagram. Although honestly, like I said before, if those people are other than your family and friends and actual past guests, I think that can be fine. But overlooking Airbnb and going straight to direct booking. And I can't reconcile that one because it feels like who's doing your marketing for you and how are people finding you? I actually agree with you on that one. Um, if I say, for example, I got a vacation property um, somewhere, I would probably do, I would start off probably doing both, but I would probably use Airbnb to basically get people in, um, and then do repeat guests, get them in, and then start working on also being able to get you know a decent following on Instagram. I think what I'm seeing a lot, which I love watching, I don't really know why, but I think other people do as well, is when people start making like new properties, and you're kind of like it's like watching a baby grow because mm -hmm. you get to see step by step how they do it and mm -hmm. i've realized people really enjoy that and people have actually got a decent amount of followings by like basically showing the process of building it mm -hmm. and then being like creating a website and being like hey join our waiting list to be one of the first people to stay at this property you've been watching yeah. for the last two years so yeah yeah we did that with instagram and i will say our first fall season was fully booked in three days and i think it was yeah. because we had already built up an email list and we had and again back to that original point though i think when we launched we had less than two thousand followers on instagram which to me felt huge at the time i had yeah. never grown a cabin instagram over a thousand at that point and i was like look at this one we have double and i was like very proud of it so it doesn't take a lot but that is a good way if you're documenting the build and telling your story to get people invested in staying. No, 100%. Okay. And to, you definitely have one of the bigger followings that I've seen because obviously I've spoken to a lot of hosts. You've got to be up there surely with the top 1% in terms of followers, no? I have no idea. I know. I mean, I know of other ones that have done really well, but um, I don't know where we rank. I've never, I've tried to not, I, I always advise when I'm consulting people about this, but like vanity metrics can be so addicting. And I will say, and I don't actually think having 100,000 followers has led to we're booking slower now than we did at the beginning. And we yeah. have much more followers. So I think it's not it's something, but it's not everything having the right followers. And we have a lot of followers who are other cabin owners who want to build a cabin like ours, use the designs we used, know what our paint colors are. Right. And that's a huge portion of our followers. We're not booking stays. Right. So 
being smart. Now I've intentionally marketed to that group because we have a podcast. I love doing cabin consultations. I love that community, but it isn't necessarily a revenue stream for us. It's more just, I like that community. If you're dreaming about a cabin build or are in the midst of a build, or you just bought a place and are getting ready to host for the very first time, regardless of where you are, sometimes you just need a little help along the way. Shared experiences from someone who's been there, advice from someone who's learned a lot of lessons the hard way, that's me, or a cheerleader as you finish up. All of these reasons are exactly why I started offering cabin consultations to our Instagram followers and friends who could use some specific one-on-one help. I can't promise to solve all your problems, but I can promise to be transparent about our build costs and process, our organization and project management systems, our favorite and least favorite tools for renting, how we market, and how we found ourselves with almost 80,000 Instagram followers and 100% occupancy in our first year of hosting at Cozy Rock. So if that sounds like it might help you, feel free to visit us at staycozycabin.com or on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin and sign up for a time to chat there. For sure, um, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple more. Go on. No accountability either for guests because I know that Airbnb, if your get if your host cancels at the last minute, Airbnb will find you. They claim they'll find you an equal property to host you. So that's a scary part about Airbnb versus a hotel. If you've booked a hotel, the amount of times I've heard horror stories about someone traveling somewhere and their hotel canceling at the last minute is like never. But I yeah. have heard horror stories of host canceling. And if it's direct booking, again, I'm not undermined by Airbnb. So I, as a host, can do whatever I want. But that doesn't give guests that accountability. True. Um, I guess in terms of that, there is, and I guess it's even probably through Airbnb, there is a certain, I guess with Airbnb, you have a slight more protection. But there's always going to be a degree of trust on both sides, right? Because when you're letting someone into your property, you are trusting that they're not going to burn it down. That's right. And vice versa. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely is a good point. If I'm being totally honest, we have worked with quite a lot of people. I've never seen an issue like that. And as someone who does book direct more than they don't, I've had excellent experiences. But no, 100%. I think that is... I didn't actually even think about that until you just brought it up. So I haven't seen anything like it, but that's not me saying that it never could happen for sure. So that is an excellent point. I do think the reality is that hosts who are moving to direct booking for the most part are hosts who view it as a business, even if it's their personal property that they use as well. They take it very seriously. They value customer service. And I think that probably eliminates some of the folks who would be more apt to cancel. And so I would think yeah. by default, just the nature of setting up, going through the work of setting up a direct booking site, you're probably already filtering out some of the best hosts would be my guess. No, for sure. And I think uh, not everyone is going to do, because for some people, it just won't be worth doing it, right? They're happy on Airbnb and it doesn't really make sense. So you're right. You do tend to get people who are more serious about it for them to go and want to have a website that people can book through and want to be able to potentially make more money and have more control. You do tend to get more serious hosts and also, for example, even if it's someone who has, let's say, a thousand followers, you at least on Instagram, let's say you at least have a they've probably done at least a decent amount of work to kind of build up some trust um, yeah. and stuff like that. So with the people we tend to to work with, that hasn't been an issue. But no, I right. think it's a good point for sure. And then I think on that same note, the last one is just no customer service guarantee because I think Airbnb offering super hosts and letting guests review the hosts and the property. A lot of times when I'm booking properties, the first thing I do is read the reviews. Even if they're five stars, I just read them to see what they have to say about like the neighborhood or is there a loud barking dog next door? Just the little stuff that someone might bring up in a review And without, I don't know how direct booking sites work, but are you able to review the property? Does the property have reviews of what past guests have said? 100%. So you can do reviews, but also what you could do, which we recommend to people to do as well, is um, you could use, for example, Google Business to get reviews through that. So a lot of people Mm -hmm. do that and set up a Google Business because it's also good for SEO. 
but then also ask people once they've stayed because what we do have is also automated emails so once someone stayed you can it will send them an automated email just being like hey hope you had an amazing stay um, we do have some people who will offer like a coupon which is like hey if you come back here's five percent and if you could leave a review this would be amazing and i'll put a link to the google business and also to do it on the website and you know a lot of people if they are they are happy with their stay they're more than happy to do that and it's another way of building it up and also like you said building up that trust as well yeah okay i'm adding that to my to-do list to create a google business regardless of whether i go direct booking but just so that i have that that was not something i thought to do although do i have to put the address on it if i do that i think there are ways of getting around that like you could put like around the area rather than a specific okay. location but don't but they have to it, mail you uh at least when i do my business one i have to put the address and then they mail me something in the mail with a confirmation code and that's how i set it up anyway this uh, is off topic i'll look into okay. that I don't want people to have the address. I've had Instagram followers ask before, like, oh, I live in the area. Can I just swing by? And I, um, my answer is always no, because I want guests to have their experience. Like, as far as I'm concerned, if you've booked it, it is your house. And nobody yeah. wants strangers driving by their house. And we're on a dead end. And so it's not a discreet, you know, you'd be like pulling into the driveway and turning around. So yeah. Random quick question, which is a slightly off topic. The only reason I bring it up because I was literally talking to someone about this. Have you had any issue with people just turning up and being like, I want to take pictures of this property and just be outside, take some pictures quickly and leave? Because um, one of the first podcasts I did was with the Alpaca Treehouse in Atlanta. And she was saying that they had to put signs up because people would just turn up on their on their doorstep and just be taking pictures. And they were like, you can't do this. Thank God we have not had that happen, but we have had people ask to come just because they want to see it. And that's what makes okay. me very nervous of just not wanting the address out there. And even with okay. guests, they don't get the address until the day before their stay for yeah. that reason. Um, because some of our guests live locally. It's not that we don't trust them. It's just I care deeply about respecting the experience of whoever has booked it. Oh, man, that like made me feel a little anxious hearing that that they did that. I feel so sad for yeah, them. Yeah, in no, no. In fairness, their their property was on a Netflix on a few Netflix series, and I think one of them was the world's most amazing uh, vacation properties. So, and they gave yeah. away the address because we were on no. Captain Chronicles recently, and I didn't even think about that as an out like a possible outcome. So people can kind of work it out just based on because they also do like alpaca yoga as well. So people can kind of work out based on like certain things, how to find it. So uh, no, I wouldn't worry. So maybe I, I worry. don't want us to show up on SEO. These are great things to think about, Jared. Yes. And to be honest, I wouldn't. I think for them, it was very specific just because if you think about how many people watch Netflix and probably how many people saw that show, it was like probably a decent amount of people so yeah um i think it was slightly i i don't hear that a lot i'm gonna be honest okay Whew. um okay so then you know with our last couple of minutes i'd love to hear you obviously run a direct booking site there's a lot of different options out there tell the people what makes your direct booking site different from the other ones and if they're looking around for a direct booking site what are some things they should absolutely look for in a site before they set up an account with them. Yeah, 100%. So what I'll do is I'll start off. So it's not necessarily uh, just about me, but I'll start off with stuff they should look for. Great. I think things which are super important is obviously making it as easy as possible for people to book. Um, you don't want it to be a website. I think one of the good things Airbnb have is you find a listing, you're on there. It's pretty easy to get to the point where you're paying, putting your information in, so on and so forth. So obviously finding a solution that makes that super easy. So for ours, it's three steps from the homepage to basically booking is three steps. And we try to keep it super simple and, you know, try to get from A to, let's say, Z as quickly as possible and in a way which is efficient. Um, I think something that a lot of people we've seen really enjoy and like having is being able to offer additional services through your website so for example we have some people who for example the people who do elopements they have like wedding packages that they have and it's a way of them being able to upsell directly through while checking out this and that's one done really well of making money because it could even be stuff like i don't know firewood or whatever or yep even i've seen that working. before 
yeah or working with local businesses we have people who do that they'll work with local businesses mm -hmm. they'll basically do the whole process in terms of being able to say for example you live in a place where you can do skiing imagine you could go and your skis are already there or your surfboard or whatever and you're not having to go through that whole process. So, Jared, why uh, did this not come up during advantages of direct booking for hosts? This is the most compelling thing I've heard so far. That is a good point. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we're bringing this up now. But yes, I think uh, for sure we should have brought that up as a good point because upselling. Because is... we love partnering with local businesses, but all we do is recommend them in our guidebook, and you have to call and book it yourself. I would love to make it easier for folks to literally order charcuterie from the booking site and then it's in the fridge, which they can do. She knows how to get in and she can drop it off, but I don't know how to make the buying process simpler. If you had a direct booking website that does top selling, <laughs> you would be able to do that very easily. So, Okay, I will well, say my ticker towards sold just moved. That one was very compelling for me. Okay, finally, finally. <laughs> um, no, I think that's great in terms of, it's a great way to make extra money. But it's also, uh, it sounds like you work with local businesses. It's a great way to kind of build, I guess, rapport with them as well mm -hmm. and make people stay. Because, for example, I did a surf holiday a few years ago and I had to go find somewhere to find a surfboard. I didn't know the area super well. So, like, it just makes it a lot easier for the guests as well. And then they're happier. Right. Your chance of getting five star reviews is higher. So, you know, it just makes life a lot, a lot easier. And uh, yeah, I think that's definitely something worth having. Um, automated emails, I think, is vital because I think I, I'm remembering all the good advantages. Yeah. Um, automation is for direct bookings to work. Ideally, you want it to be as simple as possible for the host. Part of the reason you have a website is because you don't want have to, you don't want people to have to basically go and do the blocking out of dates, collecting the money, all this stuff. So having stuff that automates that whole process is mm -hmm. vital. And most, I'm assuming most solutions will offer some type of automation. Um, and that's even, for example, I know Airbnb do the same thing, but sending the guidebook to them, let's say the day before they arrive yeah. automatically, um, sending them an email after they stayed, asking for them to do reviews. That's right. You could even send one during their time there and just saying, hey, how's your stay doing? Is there anything that you need? If you do, contact us here. So it's just a way yep. of, it, you know, increasing the customer, I guess, customer service in a way which is automated because which makes your life you don't want to have to do that. Exactly. Um, yeah. I would think calendar syncing would be an important one to look for too, especially if you're doing it with, obviously the more places you're listed, the, you know, the more chances that people will find you. So if you're listed on VRBO and Airbnb and want to do direct booking a way for all those calendars to sync up. I can already feel that you're coming on to the direct booking way. I like this. You're actually, <laughs> you're giving me reasons. A hundred percent. That is a, probably one of the most important things is you don't want to have to deal with double booking. So if you yeah. are looking for one, a hundred percent, you need to find one that does calendar syncing. 99% of them will um, ours do because if they don't, I probably wouldn't go with them just because that is a like feature. Oh, I can't imagine. Is, yeah you don't want double bookings um, that's like what that would... nightmares are made of yes you don't want two people turning up on the same day and being like there's only one house so um yes 100 percent um i think this one's maybe a little bit less but i think it works so well as well is coupons um huh. you can basically generate coupons and what some of our guests will, or what some of our customers will do is once someone stayed, they'll send them with an automated email here's five percent off your next day it encourages people to come back and like they that. could potentially have that for a friend as well say they can't stay but they have a friend who wants to come they get to enjoy the the five percent and you know you're still making more money but it's like a little incentive for people to come back so yeah i would highly highly recommend that um one that looks good in terms of the page uh the pages uh what we do is we we work really closely with the customers to make sure that they're happy the way the site looks and it kind of matches kind of the look and feel that they're going for. Um, we encourage uh, a lot of our customers to try and include video as well. I think video works really well 
to kind of really kind of promote the the property. People are very visual nowadays. And now you're you know, speaking to my heart. And Airbnb does not let you put video on your listing. And it makes me so mad. Why have they not added that yet? I'm assuming the only reason they haven't is because they don't want to have to go through and check because they obviously check the pictures because they don't want people putting pictures, which they... Oh, that's true. So okay, assuming... but you allow video. No, of course. And uh, we work we work very closely with a lot of people we work with have amazing like they all have like content creators come in and they have amazing video which they normally have on you know instagram but being able to put it on their website as well is is great so um that i'm trying to think if there's anything else which is like a must-have um ah payment methods just having multiple mm -hmm. ways of being able to pay as well i think the more flexibility the better um yeah we support multiple ways of paying and we try and work closely with the with our customers so that whatever way that they're, they're taking payments they feel comfortable with and um something we work we work very closely with our customers in terms of making sure that they understand i guess the ramifications of using one compared to the others and there's been some times that have been like we just want to do actually we haven't had anyone do this but for example we did have one person who gets like they tend to get kind of an older kind of clientele coming through or older guests and they were offering check and eventually we kind of spoke to them we do offer that but i haven't even seen a checkbook in about 10 15 years to be honest but people are then still you doing don't it, own so. a property in a rural area because the amount of my vendors who insist that i pay them via check for 35 dollars is absolutely mind-blowing really so you have a checkbook that you're using it like often oh yes I'm... i just recently i i write checks all of the time and okay. i and i receive them for my business but i just realized you can do it via your bank account so now i don't write them as much i go to my bank account and it takes a week to get there but i don't have to worry about stamps or mailing it it comes directly from that which makes my life easier. okay it is still very much alive in certain regions <laughs> okay i'm surprised because yeah and i feel like now i pay everything by card and absolutely me too it, it's yeah it's a good and a bad thing because you i'm trying to convince my yeah, I'm trying to convince my hot tub guy to create a Venmo account and he won't do it. So I have to mail him a check every month. Like, I'm like, Ryan, just create a Venmo account. This would be so much easier. I could pay you immediately. Nope, won't do it. Did he say why? Because there must be a good reason, no? I'm I assuming he doesn't it. trust banks. I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, no. I <laughs> we, we, we do support that. But yes, we don't have too many people who take check just because like you said, there's the ability for it potentially to get lost. It just adds on to the lead time. So it's just, it, it doesn't necessarily it's make sense. Pain in the but, ass. Yes. But having different ways of paying is super important as well. And then I guess just to quickly talk about us. Um, yeah. All the stuff we spoke about are features which we, we offer. Um, something that makes us different from, I guess, a lot of other ones is that once the website is created, we also offer... Um, the ability to be able to maintain the website to so make sure the security is done. We work very closely with customers where they might want to change certain stuff on the website, but they don't want to have the hassle of having to work out how to do it. So we work closely with them to actually make those changes. Um, and essentially, we allow them, we have some people who are super tech savvy. So once the website is done, they might just pay for hosting. But then we have other people who they just want anything to do with the website they just want us to do it and we're more than happy to do that. So um, yeah, that's a hundred percent an advantage, which we, we love as some, as uh, someone who's obviously a developer, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always, it's always a good thing to do. Okay. This leads me to my last question then, which is obviously we talked a lot about Airbnb service fees and how that's increasing rates to stay places, but all of the work that you're doing to create this direct booking site can't be free. And I'm guessing that it's hosts, not guests who pay for that. So tell me what the revenue model looks like um, on your side, not your whole business model, but like what do hosts pay to get started on direct booking? What are those startup costs? What are the ongoing costs of that? Yep. Okay. So for us, what we have is we have what we call a sign up fee. Um, and what that is, because we create the website from, from scratch, is it's essentially a fee to basically create the website um, 
and that's from the ground up. So that's creating the property pages, that's setting up all the rates, uh, that's setting up the automated emails, so everything to do with that. And we, you know, work closely with the customers to set that all up and make sure they're happy with that. So that is a thousand dollars to basically set it up. And then once that is done, we basically have three tiers, which we call, uh, we have different subscriptions. So one of them is like a hosting, which a hosting fee, which essentially what gets that gets you is we'll host your website for you. So you don't have the hassle of having to, you know, pay to basically host it. Uh, we'll make sure that all of the security updates are done, stuff like that. And that's $50, $50 a month. Um, then we have a second tier, which what most of our customers are on, which is a hundred a month, which is essentially any small changes that you want to make on the website. So that could be new content that could be adding new pictures, videos, changing rates so on and so forth. Um, that is a hundred, a hundred a month. And so then we have change any of that themselves. You have so... to do all of that. No, they. So what we also provide is once the website is created, uh, we do provide essentially videos that explain how to make those changes if you want to. Okay. Um, the one for a hundred is essentially just for anyone who is like, we might not be making like we might not have a whole bunch of properties that we would like to change the videos, the pictures, add pop ups, all this stuff, but we might change our rates a few times a month. We might have uh, content creators coming in where we want to add new pictures and video or content and stuff like that so we basically handle that all for them and that tends to be a lot of the people we tend to work with are people who aren't uh, let's say tech savvy and they essentially just want to pass it over to us and just be like listen i want this picture up there can you just do it for me yeah um, and that works really well and then our final package is 150 which is for larger changes so that's for example some people want to have pop-ups that they're changing regularly and stuff like that for marketing um that's essentially the price for for that one so it's any larger changes they tend to add new properties um quite regularly it's for you know people who want to be changing their website a lot what about for property owners who already have a website is there an option to like integrate a booking form onto an already existing website unfortunately not for what we offer there are other places 100 percent you'd be able to do that um for us, we like to keep it because we're using a certain solution. We do like to keep it all together because it's also about consistency in terms mm -hmm. of what I was telling you before, in terms of the steps, because we've obviously done our testing to make sure like, okay, what's the best way to get the bookings? Whereas if you're putting your booking form on a random page where someone might never see it, it makes it a lot more difficult as well. So it's also for like continuity as well it tends to help with that because yeah we get asked about that a lot and you know i think it it just it helps a lot in terms of making sure that we're making it as easy for people to book which is essentially you know what you want as the, mm -hmm. the end case but also say for example you're using something like squarespace or something like that the features will be less there are features which we're offering right. just because it is our solution so you know I don't think you're going to be able to do, say you have a Squarespace site, you're not going to be able to add additional services at checkout very easily. There might be a way How of doing it. How did you know it. I had a Squarespace site? I didn't, but you know, I'm, I'm definitely not as a programmer. I don't hate Squarespace, um, but yes, it's, uh, it's definitely, I think it's good to start off with. But it's like with anything, it's kind of the, it's, it's like the baby, I guess the baby bike with the toddler wheels. And then it's stepping up to, I guess, the next level, which is, yeah. you know, the racing bike, the one that goes quick. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. This is the racing bike of direct booking. <laughs> Someone's going to bring that up later on and be like, I never said that. And they're going to show me this and I'm going to be like, oh, it's going to be on YouTube as well. So, um, okay. Jared, can you tell the people where to find you the name of your podcast? I think you might've mentioned at the beginning, one more time, Instagram, any other place that they can find you if they want more information, either about your podcast or about setting up a direct booking site. Yep. hundred percent. So the podcast is beyond the property and, uh, yeah, episodes come out every Monday for that. So you can find it at Spotify, uh, yeah, anywhere you find your podcast, you can find that. And then in terms of the vacation property stuff, it is uh, directvacationbookings.com 
or you can also find us on instagram as well which is direct vacation bookings and uh yeah anyone who's interested by all means get get in contact for sure uh, and folks, Jared did not pay me to be on this podcast and he might not be happy to know that we're also working with Airbnb to get someone to speak to the other side of direct booking sometime. In Wait, what? <laughs> so, you don't tell me this. <laughs> so stay no, tuned for not. a future episode. The idea here is just, this is obviously something that we're on all sides of and getting folks to really, for me, I mean, honestly, selfishly for me, it's really a lot of the stuff that you shared is helpful and stuff I hadn't thought about. So I figured it might yeah. be helpful for others. Thank you, Jared. No. For sure. No, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. I listen to the podcast and love it. So, uh, yes, thank you for bringing me on. Yeah, it was great to meet you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. And if you like what you heard, feel free to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or share some of your favorite parts over on Apple Podcasts and a review. If you have any suggestions for guests or feedback, you can always find us on Instagram at Cozy Rock Cabin and the chalet frame spelled c-h-a-l-a see you next week and thanks for joining us